Thank you very much. G good afternoon uh, to, to those who are following us from that part of the world and, and good morning to, to our distinguished panelists who, who are joining us from the US uh, in New York and, and, and Washington. I, I do welcome you to the second edition of Aswan Forum for Sustainable Peace and Development. The official inauguration was yesterday and, and today uh, it's, it's, it, it's held from 5th, 1st to, to 5th of March under the theme shaping Africa's new normal, recovering stronger and rebuilding. But I, I, I wish to, to, this is the fourth session in, in the forum and I, I would like to welcome you all to the second session of, of today's uh, that will focus on operationalizing the structural prevention ag agenda into our peace and security frameworks in Africa. We have a very high level distinguished panel with us today whom all have acquired unique experiences and, and deep knowledge, and they will share with us their views on ensuring the efficiency of our structural prevention mechanisms, and in order to better achieve our common peace and security aspirations on the continent. Uh, on the continent. Uh, uh, and I believe we will cover the, 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 the issue from a conceptual approach rather than uh, an operational approach. From a theoretical point of view, the African structural prevention and early warning mechanisms are well placed in our peace and security architecture. We call it APSA in the African Union. Um, and I must underscore that it encompasses an important role for women given their critical uh, 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 role in, in prevention. We have something called FEMWISE, which is, uh, ha has been operationalized and doing a great job in the African Union. However, the challenge remains in operationalizing those frameworks on the ground and in enhancing our abilities in preventing conflicts before they uh, erupt, uh, as well as preventing relapse into, into conflicts. The COVID-19 pandemic uh, this year has further ag aggravated uh, um, the, the already complex peace and security challenges facing our continent and consequently has underscored the, uh, the urgent need for reinforcing our approach to structural prevention in a holistic overarching approach, focusing on the humanitarian development peace uh, nexus, while systematically addressing the structural drivers of, of conflict and, and violence. I would like now to, ter, uh, to turn and, and to give the floor to our esteemed uh, panelists to share their uh, um, respective views, requesting them to adhere to five to seven, eight minutes uh, time uh, limit. And I would like to, to, to welcome all of them. We have with us uh, today, um, Her Excellency Ambassador Rosemary de, de Carlo, Under Secretary General in the UN for Political uh, and Peacebuilding Affairs, uh, and His Excellency Mr. Ramadan Amamra, African Union High Representative for Silencing the Guns uh, in Africa. And, and my dear brother as well, uh, uh, Mr. Eddie Maluka, the CEO of the African Peer uh, the Review Mechanism, the APRM. APRM is, is our governance arm of, of, the, of the African Union. And we have as well Mr. Ernest uh, Adu uh, uh, Guyamfi, board chairman of the National Peace Council of the Republic of, of Ghana. And, and he was adding a lot from the national perspective and his his rich experiences. And last but not least, Her Excellency, Ms. Deborah Witzel, the Director for Regional Integration for Africa and the Middle East at the World Bank. First, I, I wish to give the floor to, to, to my, my former uh, distinguished colleague, Ambassador USG, Rosemary De Carlo. Your Excellency, in January 2020, before the COVID-19 pandemic became a reality, Your Excellency emphasized the importance of the, the UNSG's uh, surge in diplomacy for peace. As a pillar in the UN mandate, underscoring that at the heart of this approach is prevention, prevention of conflicts, but also uh, of the phenomenon that lead to social, uh, of, of that phenomena that lead to social, economic, and political instability and fragility. Your Excellency also recently stated that recovering better from COVID-19 requires more political and financial investment to strengthen conflict uh, pre prevention. In light of that, uh, to what extent, uh, Ms. De Carlo, has, has the Department of Political Affairs and Peacebuilding Affairs in the, in the UN Secretariat realigned its priorities and sequenced 
its interventions to address immediate uh, needs vis-a-vis -vis long term investments in strengthening capacities for prevention and building resilience. How has the department provided uh, effective support to African states, regional organizations, uh, and of course, at, at the heart of that, the African Union to advance response and recovery efforts that take into account structural vulnerabilities and inequalities. You have the floor, uh, distinguished uh, USG, you have the floor. Thank, thank you, Ambassador Abdel Halek. It's a great pleasure for me uh, to take part in this discussion today. Uh, Ambassador, your questions get to the heart of the prevention challenge we face. And I'd like to make three points in response. First, current peace and security trends indicate a volatile environment in the coming years. This puts a significant premium on prevention. Conflicts are more fragmented and regionalized, which makes them harder to resolve. And increasingly, conflict dynamics are affected by other major risk factors. Key among these is the climate emergency. Many conflict affected countries are also among the most climate stressed. We thus see a deepening intersection between fragility and climate change. Technology, which has brought advancement to millions, has also served as a disruptor, and that has allowed for the proliferation of disinformation and hate speech. The effects can contribute to incitement and violence. And of course, the COVID-19 pandemic has exacerbated inequalities and divisions among populations that we will have to address for years to come. Forced displacement has skyrocketed. Humanitarian needs have set new records. Women and girls especially have been disproportionately effective, including through an unprecedented spike in domestic and gender-based violence during the pandemic. And at a time when international cooperation is most needed to address these challenges, we are facing a rise in global and regional strategic competition that is creating fractures in the multilateral system. We're already struggling to respond to the many conflicts that exist today, and it will be all the more difficult to respond to new ones as these multiple risks converge. <clears throat> the only real solution is prevention. Prevention, you could argue, helps flatten the curve of conflict. My second point, we must adapt the way we do prevention to this new reality. We need to focus not only on high level political engagement, but also on building anticipatory relations, supporting long-term agendas that are conducive to peace and addressing factors in a more holistic way. Ambassador, you've asked how we have realigned our priorities to balance between immediate needs and longer term investments. Our experience shows that these are intrinsically linked. Effective long-term prevention work provides the foundation and relationships that help us respond in a more agile, immediate way if crises do break out. So what are we doing, you ask? Well, we have expanded our analytical lens to look at a wider range of issues that may trigger instability and conflict. For example, my department has established a climate security mechanism along with UNDP and UNEP that enables us to better address climate-related security risks and simultaneously help design peace, positive adaptation and mitigation strategies. We're doing so in West Africa, for example, in close collaboration with regional partners. We're also working in a more integrated manner with development actors, recognizing that socioeconomic factors often lie at the root of conflict. A recent example is our comprehensive regional prevention strategy for the Horn of Africa, which brings the UN system together in support of regional efforts by the AU and EGAD. The Peacebuilding Fund, which has invested 394 million US dollars on the African continent from 2017 to 2019, is a key vehicle for this work. Further, we have invested in building national capacities for conflict prevention on the understanding that prevention is more effective when it is led by national or local actors. Through my department's joint program with UNDP, we have deployed peace and development advisors to over 25 countries on the continent where they support national capacities for dialogue and facilitation. In Nigeria, for example, we have helped establish a national coordination platform to address farmer herder conflicts. 
a critical issue due to the effects of climate change. In almost all of the countries where they are deployed, from Chad and Kenya to Uganda, our peace and development advisors are supporting UN country presences in working with national counterparts to address imp the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on social cohesion. We've also placed inclusion at the center of our efforts. Genuine, meaningful inclusion helps remedy structural inequalities and address other root causes of conflict, thus making peace agreements and transitions more durable. There's been great momentum for this agenda in Africa, where the UN and the AU have established the African Women Leaders Network in 2017, which now has 25 national chapters across the continent, and the African Union's uh, African Women's Leadership Fund. Digital technologies represent a new frontier for our efforts to promote inclusion. By lowering the barriers to access faced by traditionally marginalized groups, particularly women, they hold great promise for our efforts to promote meaningful participation of these groups in political processes. In Libya, our mission facilitated virtual consultations with women's groups, which contributed to the Libyan Political Dialogue Forum Roadmap to the 2021 elections and the commitment to include 30% of women in leadership positions of the new executive. This brings me to my final point. To address the current challenges, we must build new coalitions for prevention. Regional organizations are a central part of this effort. The challenges we face today are too complex for any one entity to face on its own. An effective conflict prevention approach requires that the UN, the AU, and sub-regional organizations in Africa work closely together. Now the AU has put in place a robust and innovative conflict prevention architecture, which the United Nations fully supports. And I'm very pleased that Ramtam Lamamra and Eddie Maloka are participating in today's panel as both the Silencing the Guns Initiative and the African Peer Review Mechanism play a crucial role in this area. The partnership with the African Union and sub-regional organizations is of strategic and substantive importance for the Secretary General and for my department. I look forward to engaging with you to discuss new ways to strengthen this work. Thank you very much. Thank you very much in, indeed for, for this very extremely uh, uh, rich and, and uh, um, um, rich input and, and comprehensive approach and, and the way that you have you have shown to all of us how the UN is adapting and, and, and coping with new challenges and, and, and trying to encompass all, all different related uh, challenges in one full comprehensive approach, the new coalitions and, and so on that uh, be in place with, with the inter regional organizations is, is extremely important. And I, uh, with that uh, note, I give the floor to, to to the goal of peace and security in Africa, His Excellency Ramadan Al Amamra, a role model and a legend of peace and security in Africa, said the AU theme of the year 2020 was silencing the guns, creating conducive conditions for Africa's development. This coincides with the outbreak of the COVID 19 pandemic with grave multifaceted implications on the peace and security and development landscape in Africa, thus complicating continental efforts to silence the guns and achieve a prosperous Africa grounded uh, as grounded in the vision of Agenda uh, 2063. Your Excellency, while the extension of the AU uh, Master Roadmap on silencing the guns for another decade reflects African political will, uh, a very strong one, and leadership, how can this momentum be translated into effective action on the ground and to that end, which important lessons learned from, from operationalization of the roadmap can be leveraged uh, on while moving forward in, in order to realize a resilient and strong recovery post uh, uh, COVID-19 in Africa. You have the floor, uh, uh, Seth. Shukran, shukran jazeel and akhi Usama. Merci. Merci beaucoup. Merci pour l'invitation et merci à nos amis du Forum d'Assouan d'avoir 
réussi à organiser cette deuxième édition dans les conditions que la pandémie a, a imposées. Je suis ravi d'y participer cette année, comme je l'ai fait euh, l'année dernière. Je voudrais saluer Oussama, notre modérateur, pour son engagement, pour son dynamisme, et également adresser mes salutations amicales à, à tous mes collègues, les autres panélistes. Je tiens en particulier à applaudir notre collègue et ami, l'ambassadeur Rosemary De Carlo, pour son excellente présentation. En fait, si ce n'était pour la diversité linguistique qui fait que nous développons des idées très proches, similaires, nous aurons pu nous contenter de l'excellente présentation qui, encore une fois, a le mérite d'avoir synthétisé les grandes actions, les grandes perspectives de l'objet de notre présente session. En réponse directe à la question, je voudrais d'abord indiquer que le, la pandémie COVID-19 a bouleversé bien des réalités, perturbé bien des projets et des programmes et imposé à, aux États comme à la communauté internationale des révisions déchirantes qui prennent en charge évidemment l'inadéquation qui a été vérifiée entre les grands moyens disponibles, notamment chez les pays les plus développés, et les exigences de cette épreuve sanitaire de, de grande envergure. En vérité, le, le, la conception même de la sécurité humaine, humaine s'en est trouvée affectée, puisque alors que les, beaucoup d'analystes concevaient la sécurité en termes de comment faire face à des menaces d'ordre militaire, d'ordre économique, d'ordre environnemental, il est arrivé que c'est un défi sanitaire qui a mis à rude épreuve, j'allais dire, la planète tout entière, la quasi-totalité de l'humanité en imposant, des, comme je l'indiquais, des révisions déchirantes aux politiques de santé publique comme aux politiques de, de développement et même, et même aux perspectives de paix de paix et de sécurité. S'agissant spécifiquement de, de l'Afrique qui a été affectée très durement en raison des, des faiblesses structurelles. S'agissant donc de, de l'Afrique qui a été éprouvée de cette manière très, très durement, je dirais oui, les perspectives de de paix et de sécurité sont, sont, sont trouvés touchés. Les efforts ont sans doute été perturbés, des moyens ont été divertis, des ressources qui étaient affectées à la préservation de la paix, à la prévention structurelle des conflits ont été donc euh, ont eu à être orientées vers d'autres priorités. Mais le fait est que les défis à la paix et la sécurité en Afrique existaient avant la pandémie, continuent d'exister pendant la pandémie et existeront après la pandémie. Il est donc important de nous inscrire dans cette perspective post-pandémie, d'être partie prenante totale, totalement engagée avec le reste de la communauté internationale pour contribuer à édifier un nouvel ordre des relations internationales post Covid, qui tiennent compte des apports et des besoins de tout un chacun au nom de cette indivisibilité de la dignité de la personne humaine partout à travers le monde. J'ajouterai d'ailleurs que le défi d'une campagne mondiale de vaccination qui ne laisse personne sur la marge, qui ne laisse personne derrière, qui bénéficie aussi bien aux pays en voie de développement d'Afrique aux pays les plus, les plus développés, ce défi-là est un test de crédibilité par rapport 
aux enseignements que nous devons tous tirer de la manière dont la pandémie a affecté les uns et les autres et a considéré que l'humanité n'était pas en vérité préparée du fait de la césure nord-sud, du fait des inégalités de développement, du fait des inégalités dans les capacités installées en matière de santé publique et de prise en charge de ces exigences à réagir promptement, efficacement pour mettre nos peuples et toutes les personnes humaines, donc les doter du maximum de, de conditions pour pouvoir s'en tirer à bon compte. Naturellement, le nombre de la population affectée, les victimes, partout dans le monde, pas seulement en Afrique, nous interpelle une fois de plus afin de concevoir cette valeur de la personne humaine, de la dignité de la vie humaine comme étant au centre de toutes nos raisons d'être en tant que nation, mais également en tant qu'organisation internationale, universelle et euh, euh, régionale. Prévention euh, Structurel, c'est d'abord avant tout, contrairement à la prévention euh, immédiate, à la, pro, à la prévention opérationnelle qui met en, en, en exercice, qui met en déploiement les capacités de négociation, de bons offices, de médiation. La prévention structurelle, elle, c'est celle qui s'adresse aux causes profondes des conflits. Et donc, par définition, il s'agit d'une œuvre de longue haleine, il s'agit de travailler sur le développement, le développement économique et social, sur la gouvernance, afin de faire en sorte que les êtres humains puissent se sentir pris en charge par leur propre système d'organisation politique, socio-économique. Il s'agit également de vérifier que toutes les structures de régulation de la vie économique et sociale sont telles que chacun se sente partie prenante. Naturellement, la bonne gouvernance est partie intégrante de la prévention structurelle et dans l'organisation interne de chacun de nos pays, comme l'expérience de l'Afrique l'a surabondamment prouvé, la double équation, la double équation de l'unité et de la diversité. Comment réaliser un équilibre harmonieux entre l'unité nationale et toutes les diversités qui sont en œuvre dans chacune des sociétés africaines constituent une condition essentielle de la prévention structurelle. L'équation de l'équilibre entre le centre et les périphéries en ce qui concerne l'allocation des ressources, en ce qui concerne l'égalité des chances entre les populations plus ou moins avantagées résidant dans les capitales et les grandes agglomérations et celles qui sont plus loin dans les zones déshéritées dans chacun des pays africains, comme l'expérience nous, nous l'a montré, constituent également un paramètre essentiel de la prévention structurelle. Alors, comme chacun sait, l'Union africaine s'est dotée d'une architecture de paix et de sécurité très complète, très performante, qui s'enrichit, notamment, comme vous l'avez indiqué, avec FemWise qui a vocation de mobiliser les femmes à travers tout le continent et de mettre leur valeur ajoutée à contribution à la fois dans la prévention, dans la manière de régler les conflits et dans la manière de s'assurer que la reconstruction et le développement post-conflit éliminent toutes les racines et tous les germes de retour à des situations de conflits de conflit armés dévastateurs. À côté, ou avant même FamWise, il y avait et il y a toujours PanWise, ce qui se réfère justement à la mobilisation de tous les sages de notre, de notre continent, qu'il s'agisse d'hommes ou de femmes, qu'il s'agisse de personnes qui ont assumé des responsabilités ou de personnes qui ont, dans l'activité quotidienne, qui, qui habitent dans les zones frontalières, qui habitent dans les zones rurales, et qui voient là où germent potentiellement les conflits et qui peuvent avantageusement intervenir à temps pour régler les conflits quand cela est à leur portée ou pour donner l'alerte afin que les mécanismes nationaux, régionaux, ceux qui sont 
organisées autour des communautés économiques régionales et des mécanismes régionaux, continentaux ou même internationaux, puissent prendre la relève. Un maître mot qui, est, qui a été souligné à juste titre dans la conclusion de notre collègue et ami Rosemary, c'est la nécessité d'une articulation appropriée de l'ensemble des acteurs, qu'il s'agisse d'acteurs politiques, d'acteurs économiques, d'acteurs humanitaires, d'acteurs sociaux sur, sur le terrain. L'Union africaine accorde la plus grande priorité à cette harmonisation de l'échelon continental, de l'échelon régional et de l'échelon national, mais elle harmonise évidemment ses propres démarches et ses propres activités avec les Nations unies et l'ensemble des agences de développement des Nations unies, avec également les organisations de, euh, du système de Bretton Woods. Et c'est cette harmonie, cette complémentarité qui est susceptible de créer de la valeur ajoutée et de faire en sorte que nos efforts seront rémunérés, seront récompensés par des dividendes de la paix, par des dividendes de la sécurité. Je terminerai en indiquant que le fait que l'Union africaine, au sommet virtuel qui s'est déroulé il y a quelques, quelques semaines, a décidé de prolonger pour une décennie le programme de faire taire les armes, cela a une grande valeur pédagogique. D'abord et avant tout pour que tous les acteurs, tous les opérateurs aient pleine conscience de ce que rien ne peut être réalisé durablement en matière de développement, en matière d'intégration, si nous ne garantissons pas au continent africain, à ses peuples, les bienfaits de la paix et de la sécurité. Évoluer résolument vers un continent exempt de conflits, un continent libéré non seulement des conflits armés, quelle que soit leur nature, inter, inter-africains, mais également des causes des conflits armés. Ceci est véritablement la clé pour permettre au continent de réaliser son objectif déclaré dans l'agenda 2063, l'Afrique que nous voulons, c'est-à-dire une Afrique libérée des conflits, mais une Afrique prospère, une Afrique qui garantit la dignité de ses peuples, qui est en paix avec elle-même et qui est également en paix avec les autres, qui soit un acteur des relations internationales, qui apporte autant qu'elle qu reçoit et qui euh, s'arme pour véritablement jouer son rôle dans la riposte de l'humanité contre les affres de la pandémie COVID-19 et de tous les autres défis sanitaires ou autres que l'humanité aura à affronter à l'avenir. Je salue donc le Forum d'Assouan pour avoir choisi précisément cette problématique et pour avoir entretenu la flamme de la concertation entre nous tous et pour faire que l'Afrique continue de mobiliser ses propres bonnes volontés comme celles du reste de ses partenaires internationaux. Shukran Jazilan. Shukran Jazilan, thank you very much. Merci infiniment, Monsieur le Haut Représentant. Uh, thank you very much uh, indeed. As we expected, you have uh, uh, agreed with, with USG, uh, uh, Rosemary De Carlo, on the, how should we act all collectively and in harmony, all, all the different actors at different levels, uh, the issue of subsidiarity and, and, and having such a wonderful holistic approach the approach you have covered, covering all the aspects, be it political, the, the socioeconomic drivers of conflict, and and uh, and the way that you have portrayed how, how we uh, would aspire to do in Africa in the coming 10 years to make uh, silencing the guns a reality is, is really impressive. I do thank you, sir. And, and now I, I switch to, to my dear uh, friend and, and colleague, Professor Eddie Maluka. Uh, um, Dr. Maluka is, is, is one of uh, your, your uh, uh, in one of your 2020 think pieces, Professor Maluka, you put forth that the APRM's work uh, can support the African Union in realizing the long-term goal of silencing the guns in Africa. You also reflected on the APRM uh, in uh, um, workshops series under the theme silencing the guns and positioning the APRM as an early warning tool for conflict prevention. 
the result of which culminated in the elaboration of the APRM framework on early warning and conflict prevention and deepening the collaboration between APRM and the African Union Peace and Security uh, uh, Council on early warning and conflict prevention issues. Furthermore, the African Union has set in place various prevention frameworks and, and tools such as the Continental Early Warning System and the Continental Structural Conflict Prevention Framework. So, uh, Your Excellency, Professor Maluka, how do such frameworks and tools coordinate and co collaborate uh, uh, and complement each other, building on comparative advantages, including of the African uh, peace and security architecture and African governance uh, architecture at large? And at the core of that uh, African governance architecture, the APRM stands uh, uh, very uniquely. How do I, APRM report findings trickle down to, to uh, uh, programmatic interventions by the African Union, regional organization, and member states in order to ensure the effective and timely addressing of structural vulnerabilities and systematic threats? Um, very complicated uh, questions, but you have all the abilities, Professor Maluka, to, to, to cover it all. You have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador. Thank you very much, uh, 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 Your Excellency Chair. And the, please allow me at the onset to sincerely convey my sincere appreciation to Aswan Forum for having invited the APRM to be part of this important uh, dialogue. And really, we, we are very, very grateful. And to, to pay tribute to, to all the panelists, uh, Mr. Chairman, and of course, uh, Ambassador Lamambra in his important work for for the work uh, for our continent and uh, Excellency um, uh, Rosemary Di Carlo and, and our colleagues will be taking the, 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 the floor later. And, and, and the questions that you raised, Mr. Chairman, are really uh, pertinent and at the core of the, the work that the APRM does. The APRM, as you know, Your Excellency, and you have said it yourself in your, in your, in your, in your uh, brief uh, uh, introduction, is anchored around good governance, our work, and one of the issues uh, uh, which we consider really as uh, structural to vulnerabilities, uh, uh, key to structural vulnerabilities and systematic threats uh, is indeed uh, uh, issues of governance. And we view governance as a prevention, as a prevention tool. And we are happy that, uh, as you said it, the Assembly of the African Union has recognized that the APRM can contribute to prevention on our continent because governance is indeed a tool for, for prevention. Myself, um, I, I viewed go governance in, in, in three senses. I call them the triple significance of governance to the African condition. Governance is the enabler. It makes it possible for us to achieve certain things. It's also a bottleneck. So it can, if the, its absence can, can impose a strain or even constrain us from doing certain things. And at the same time, it's also a precondition, especially the institutions that you need to put in place and the issues of political will, which are important in order for us. So, so governance in our view is very, very important. In order to address these uh, the threats or your excellency that we've been talking to, APRM legal instruments have provided that six months after the country review report has been peer reviewed by, by our heads of state, their excellencies, and member states have demonstrated ownership of the report, including its the, their key findings the report has to be tabled before the AU organs. And so at one level, we, in terms of uh, trickling down and taking the AU APRM uh, work and for APRM work to impact countries, one is our relationship with the Peace and Security Council. The APRM has present or we present our reviews to, to the Peace and Security Council, which as you know, has, uh, has the primary role for for, for issues around prevention and, and, and peace and uh, conflict resolution on, on, on our continent. So we, we report and we table our reports there. And the PSC has acknowledged the importance of APRM as one of the most effective mechanisms for promoting conflict prevention as it contributes to, to addressing structural root causes of conflict in the continent, particularly those relating to, to governance. And then the, the, the PSC, of course, one of the resolution that it has taken with, it has been taken, which I, we, are, we intend to will be implementing this year, is the, uh, is the collaboration and uh, working together between the APRM panel of eminent persons 
and also the African Union uh, Panel of the Wise and, and in the area of prevention and, and preventive diplomacy. The, the PSC has also requested AU Commission working collaboration with the regional economic committees and further to, uh, to strengthen cooperation with the, with, the, with, the, with, the, with the APRM. And in this regard, we, we have already started the work with, the, with SADC um, in the area of prevention. And also we, we are, will be engaging the ECOWAS uh, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this, this year. And this clearly demonstrates how the APRM findings have, have trickled down to, to, to pragmatic uh, intervention uh, by the AU. And then we've got an example uh, of how the PSC was able to use the report of the EPRM in on Mozambique on issues relating to the uh, peace and security challenges in that country to make certain interventions based on the recommendations of the uh, of the of the APRM of the APRM uh, report. And then we have, uh, as you said, Your Excellency, developed a framework on early warning and conflict prevention, which provides a roadmap of collaboration between the APRM and the various pillars of the African peace and security architecture, particularly the continental early warning system, the panel of the wise, and the regional economic communities and their regional mix up regional mechanisms. It was important that we develop this framework and, and take it to the PSC for adoption and concurrence because we it's not the we it's we don't the APRM is not a, a primary player in the in, in the prevention space or conflict resolution, but we provide support uh, to, in this case, to the PSC as a primary player on, the, on our continent through our reports and, and, and the mechanisms that I've referred to. And the, as such, the framework has been endorsed by the Peace and Security Council, and the framework guarantees an effective and timely manner of addressing structural vulnerabilities and systematic uh, threats on, on, on our continent. And uh, in the course of this year, we will be undertaking a joint retreat with the PSC to look at our reports and uh, for, 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 for the ones recent and some of the recommendation and try to develop some joint action for, 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 for reaction. And also you could say for, to assist uh, our affected uh, member states. And that retreat was supposed to have taken place last year, but we had to postpone due to COVID. And so we'll be, we'll be working on it in the course of uh, of this year, it's important that we harmonize and we work under the, the framework that is led by the PSC other than independent and outside the framework of the PSC. And the, the related uh, component to our work is that the APRM uh, report, uh, based documents provides for APRM to deploy. Uh, uh, we, we don't know what to call them, but we, we have been working with different uh, uh, you could say appellations, sometimes we call them the crisis missions, uh, we could call them the assessment missions. So the APRM has the mandate to deploy teams to countries or uh, member states when there are early signs of an impending conflict or something. We have not really actioned this, uh, uh, this, uh, this uh, mandate because we wanted concurrence with the PSC and an understanding of how this way to be, to be deployed so that we don't create uh, become part of the problem. So now that we have a framework and we now have concurrence with the with the PSC, we will be uh, hopefully, uh, inshallah, in the course of this year, we'll start deploying these missions. So these missions, the way we envision them, they'll be deployed jointly with the PSC and then they'll go, they'll do the analysis, come back into the PSC and then be able to advise the PSC on, on some, on, on the interventions uh, that are important. The, the other area, Your Excellency, which is so, this is the PSC component. The second component is the use of our national structures. APRM, we have national structures in our member states. Within the national structures, we have the political, which are government, but we have non-governmental, uh, which are established by national governments. And, and we are insisting now that they should be even be based on legislation. Many of them are based on cabinet decisions and so on. But these structures are very important. So you have, um, in other cases, we have what they call the national secretariat of the APRM. Others, you've got the, what they call the National Governing Council, which are the multi-stakeholder bodies at country level that work with the, uh, with the country to help the country undertake the reviews, but also to help the country implement the recommendations that come out of those reviews. So we have these governing councils across the continent and we have a mechanism that coordinates them. We also have a mechanism that coordinates our national secretariats uh, into one, one mechanism. And so it's, so it's important. So, that these uh, national structures have an important role in my, 
in our view, they are the interface between you to say what comes out of the reviews and implementation at the country level. So it varies from country to country and we work with them. We have an m and &E system that we've developed and then the framework for the implementation of the recommendations is what we call the national program of action. So we work with our national structures for follow up within countries and trying to assist countries to, uh, to, uh, to, to implement the recommendations that come out of the, the review reports. And that's really uh, an important. The third element, Your Excellencies, is uh, the peer review exercise itself, which happens at the level of heads of state. The APRM, we insist that the, the peer review should happen at the level of heads of states and that uh, its peers, its heads of states, who review each other, give feedback to each other, and to assist each other, to learn from each other, uh, benchmarking, uh, experience sharing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But now one of the things that we are working on and it will be going to the summit of the APRM, we are proposing a model that to strengthen these uh, peer learning, uh, you could say, uh, uh, working methods. Uh, the, 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 the focus has been now recently towards uh, 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 giving each other very good feedback, but sometimes within the constraints of the uh, diplomatic uh, considerations that of course uh, underline the work that we do as the as continental organization. So we, 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 are, we, are, we are proposing to the heads of states uh, the introduction of a more robust methodology and method of engagement of, with these reports. Uh, and we, we are confident because already the ministers have agreed to this methodology that it will be adopted by the head. So, so the peer, the peer, that's where the heads give each other feedback and to be able to say, we learn from each other and this and that and so on. And so, so for us, it's a very, very important uh, uh, work of the APRM. So really in terms of the trickle down is the, the work we are doing with the AU uh, organs, particularly the Peace and Security Council, the role of our national structures, the second level. And then the third level, which is at the high level, really the, 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 peer, the peer exercise, peer learning exercise among heads of states when they meet in closed session to give each other to receive their reports and then to respond, to respond and to debate among themselves and then to, to, to advise, to advise uh, each other. Let me just conclude your excellencies by just saying that governance is indeed a tool for, for prevention. And to say that if you look around the conflicts that are currently uh, uh, taking place on our continent, you could see that the key drivers behind this conflict or underlying this conflict are clearly governance. The one issue really is, is political will, leadership. And, and, and the leadership or the political will to do what is right for our continent. For me, it's a, it's a big issue that it starts at the level of a leader to, for a leader to say, this is not what is good for my people. This is not what is good for my country. This is not what is good for. So it's a, it's a real, and, and where there is such absence of such kind of, uh, you could say, ownership, uh, sometimes the, uh, uh, leadership could then uh, result in, in, in unintended consequences, which could result in conflict. So the issue of leadership, political will to do what is right for the continent, for me, it's a big issue. And then it's, it's where we contribute as the APRM. The second one is what was referred to by, by Excellency, the Under Secretary General, the issue of inclusion and diversity management. And then Bazar al Amamra also raised it. The diversity management around religion, our generational issues, racial, ethnic, I think the issues of diversity management, inclusion, it's a, it's, 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 it's one of the drivers. And then of course the third driver is lack or, uh, or the absence or lack of or the or existence of, of weak state institutions on our continent. The weaker the institutions of the state, the more vulnerable is that particular country to, 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 to lapsing into conflict and uh, to, to allowing a small matter to become a matter that engulfs the whole nation into, into a conflict. And this is also an area that we, we try to address and to work on with APA. And then of course, the final issue, which is really the dominant uh, problem is how you deal with the distribution of power on the continent, passage of power, transition of regimes. It's, 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 it's the most dominant source of problems we have on the continent. Of course, the mechanism that is currently being used is off elections and there's always disputes across the continent within political parties on succession, on uh, uh, transition from one government to the other, one administration to the other, peaceful transfer of power. This is a big uh, area for me that I think the APRM, we want to put some work now this year 
in working with political parties because a lot of these problems, they emanate from political parties, weaknesses within political parties. So we, we are currently trying to reach out to try to see what sort of work we can do with the political parties. We tend to, to work exclusively with the state and maybe with non-state actors, narrowly defined. But whereas political parties, we leave them out when actually some of the challenges are happening there. So I agree with the, with the two previous speakers that the solution to our continent, of course, cannot be resolved by just one actor or just two. It requires partnership, partnership within countries, partnerships across the continent, within sub-region, the regions, partnership of institutions, and of course, our friends outside the continent. And for me, Mr. Chairman, I conclude by saying, if you want to deal with issues of conflict on your conflict, on our continent, your starting point is governance, and then your second point is governance, and then your third point is governance. I thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. You're very right, Professor Maluka. It all evolves around uh, 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 governance and, and, and challenges related to governance and how to address the governance. And, and you have, co have covered it all in your very uh, rich statement. Uh, and, and, uh, and I believe what is emerging very strongly that we all need to act in harmony again and, and having such a wonderful holistic approach encompassing all, all different actors uh, and, and having a very holistic, uh, uh, genuinely holistic approach to, to do so. And I have a, I couldn't resist the temptation on commenting on, on that issue of how to, to call the, the, the assessment missions and, and so on, call them first respondents, as if they are going ah, to distinguish I'm going to know. I'm going to lobby Hello, you for please. the PSP to agree then. Hello. Thank you very much. Thank Hello, you. Hello, you're most welcome. Thank you very much. Now I, I move to, to, to uh, uh, fourthly to, to my distinguished, uh, our distinguished panelists as well, Dr. Ado Gianfi, to our, our Ghanaian uh, uh, senior official and panelist. Today, sir, Ghana remains in the lead regarding undergoing the AU's uh, country's uh, structural vulnerability and resilience assessments. During the pandemic, Ghana has showcased effective leadership recording one of the best global responses uh, thus far and witnessing a successful uh, election season as well. In that context, the Ghanaian National Peace Council, uh, led by your good self, has played a significant role in building and sustaining peace. The National Peace Council became operational in 2011, so it's almost a decade, with the main objective of strengthening <coughs> capacities for conflict prevention, coordinating prevention efforts, and promoting national and local level dialogue to cultivate a culture of, of peace, all in cooperation with the regional and district level council. So Dr. Addu, uh, again, is this backdrop, what are the lessons learned and, and best practices from the NPC's engagement to effectively strengthen a social cohesion and bolster a resilient so a social context? To what extent have these efforts along with the frameworks that Ghana has adopted and uh, domesticated at the national level been useful in mitigating the multi-layered impacts of the pandemic, including challenges to conducting elections during such unprecedented times. You have the floor, uh, um, uh, Dr. Ernst, you have the floor. Sir. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, your excellencies, various ambassadors represented eminent members and I'm grateful for the opportunity given us as a Peace Council to be part of this forum and to share in the deliberations of this day. It's been a great honor to address the forum on the theme, bringing the gap between aspiration and reality, operationalizing structural prevention in Africa. Many African countries are dealing with multiple layers of change and disruption in our various home countries. These disruptions could be driven by relentless much of new technologies, political volatility, conflict and transformation, business transformation models, and sometimes also by poverty. According to the ideas of the Pan-African Goals and Priority Areas of Agenda 2063, Africa hopes to have a peaceful and secure continent based on inclusion, inclusive growth, 
and sustainable development. It has passed to see an Africa practicing good governance, democracy, respect for human rights, justice, and the rule of law. An African with a strong cultural identity, values, and ethics, and whose development is driven by Africans. However, the reality in Africa today is an African faced with developmental challenges, particularly structural issues such as poverty, unemployment, political volatility, and conflicts. I mean, the countries such as Somalia, Southern Sudan, DR Congo, and Burundi have their own form of conflict, disruption, and their people left in despair. These are several things, in my opinion, that could be done to strengthen and break the gap between our aspiration and the realities on the ground. And for this presentation, I want to look at five specific areas. First is the issue of enhanced political inclusion. Many Africans who have talents, abilities, and the skill to contribute to the development of Africa have been left out by most governments on the continent for political reasons. In fact, in Ghana, for example, the winner takes all. That is, after every election, the government that is in power has all the power and they control everything, does not provide the needed space for opposition political actors who may have skills to contribute in a manner that can help advance the development of our country to participate in governance. And recently, the vetting of our ministers, uh, our parliament of ministers who are coming into power is an example to show some of the issues that confront us when it comes to some of these things. So the enhanced political inclusion is a needed part of the African democracy now. And some way must be found where the opposition can be brought in to also participate in governance. Second, I want to look at polarization or politicization of our state institutions. Many African governments and people accept mediocrity in our organizations and waste enormous amount of time and energy and money as a result of this. This act has presented, prevented most state institutions from operating at their maximum. They recruit party members into our security agencies and other state institutions, causing citizens to lose confidence in those institutions as we make progress. However, the good news is that relatively small improvement to the above can make a very significant impact on our development as a nation. So the issue of politicizing our institutions is a major issue on the African continent, where party members are accepted institutions instead of allowing institutions to use the professionals who are needed. The third area is political party financing. Corruption-based politics is one of the bigger ways that contribute to the gap, and it can be traced to how political parties are funded in the country. The main problem of Africa in terms of government is that people use corrupt money to finance their campaign. And therefore, they do a mapping to identify those they need to, to accomplish their political gains. And after gaining power, they sometimes dance to the tune of those who have sponsored them. And people find people to support them to come to power. And once they are in power, those are the people behind the scenes who are controlling them. This is an issue that must be addressed on the continent of Africa. Fourth is rigorous socialization of African children and youth. All of us could have been victims of poverty had it not been education. Education is the cure to extreme poverty and the higher level of education of a country's citizens, the, most, the more the, the country progresses. In Ghana, for example, the free senior high school policy is a great initiative which must be fully embraced and also strengthened. African economy will become more productive as educated citizens will be aware of the socioeconomic scenario of the country and help in the progress of that country. So the need to educate our people to understand the policies of the time 
so that political activists cannot easily tell them anything for them to believe just what they are being told is key to eradicating some of these challenges that we have on the African country, uh, continent. The fifth is industrialization of Africa. Africa should move from exporting raw materials to different parts of the world. We must begin to build industries or factories to promote more finished or processed material before exportation. Manufacturing more finished products in the country will help generate more income for the country. And by doing this, it also provides employment for the young people who are so vulnerable, who can easily be used by political activists to create chaos and confusion because they need jobs. And the need to provide jobs is key to solving some of the problems that we have in Africa. In most of our political discourse, there are a lot of young men and women who are free, who have nothing to do, and therefore they can easily be recruited and once they are recruited, a political activist finance them, and they do all these things to create chaos for the country. And so for us as a Peace Council, one of the things we do is to engage some of these act activists and do everything we can to help deal with these problems. In the past year, we have moved for the pass passing of the Vigilantism Act by Parliament that proscribes the formation of vigilante groups across the country. And in our last elections, to the glory of God, for once, none of these political vigilante groups surfaced. And this is a big plus for the country moving forward. What we need to do now is how do we sustain these things to keep these vigilante groups at bay so that the country can have peace and move forward. But if these things are going to be a reality, then the provision of jobs to integrate these young guys into active gainful employment is key to sustain the country and its peace. In conclusion, may I urge all Africans, both home and in the diaspora, to join hands to actively contribute to the transformation of the continent's human, physical, and material resources as a matter of agency. That, in my opinion, is the surest way of building the necessary bridges from the current realities of the continent to the future our children deserve and are looking out for, sustainable peace and development of Africa. And as a peace institution, I assure you that the National Peace Council will do what is required of us as an institution to pro promote sustainable peace in the country. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Ernest, for, for enriching our debate today with with this very rich input indeed. Uh, it's a very unique experience, the one that you have elaborated of the National uh, 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 Peace Council in, in Ghana. And I'm happy that you were frank enough, you have called the spade a spade in, in, in this important uh, session today. And, and that you have uh, added as well some, some developmental aspect to what we have been debating, the issue of, of education as, as an enabler and, uh, and, and uh, you have addressed as well the electoral uh, uh, um, processes uh, and challenges associated with electoral processes. So thank you very much for, for doing so. Uh, uh, last but not least, I give the floor to, to, to the distinguished director, Ms. Deborah. The year 2020 uh, saw major developments for the World Bank Group, including the launch of its strategy for fragility, conflict and violence, FC, FCV, and the related allocation of an estimated uh, uh, 25 billion US dollar in uh, IDA 19. Uh, additionally, the FCV envelope now includes the new prevention and resilience allocation, which applies the insights from the UN World Bank Pathways for Peace uh, uh, report to scale up inclusive and preventive approaches in countries at risk of falling into high intensity conflict or large scale violence. These developments are crucial as the pandemic has reaffirmed uh, the imperative for investing in, in, in prevention. Uh, uh, Ms. Deborah, in, in connection with the FCV strategy objective of uh, further uh, synergizing and mobilizing expertise and resources across the humanitarian development peace continuum, what have been uh, uh, the, ch the challenges faced by the World Bank Group at operational level and the recently published UN World Bank Partnership uh, Monitoring Report highlights the critical role played by the World Bank 
state and at least building fund, SPF, laying forth the examples of SPF's UN uh, peace building fund, uh, funded activities in Tunisia. What are the lessons learned and best practices that can be drawn from uh, this setting? Uh, this level? You have the floor, distinguished director. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be uh, here with you today um, with this distinguished set of uh, panelists and the issues that have been raised, inclusion, governance, the importance of jobs and youth are all uh, key issues that we're dealing with and I couldn't support more the, the issues that have been raised. Um, uh, as noted, uh, the discussion of uh, violence, conflict and fragility has really become a, a critical aspect of the World Bank's work. Um, I am the director of the Regional Integration Unit of the World Bank for Continental Africa, so I cover all parts of the continent. And I'm going to talk a little bit today about uh, the cross-cutting nature of the drivers of conflict and pull out some lessons with respect to that. Um, we hold uh, this issue of preventing violence, conflict, and fragility as a, as a critical priority. You've noted uh, its importance in the Ida 19 envelope and in the strategy uh, as we take that forward. Uh, we have worked very closely with the UN and other colleagues on the Pathways for Peace report and other monitoring mechanisms. So I appreciate the uh, USG's remarks as well in terms of the need for continued engagement on the humanitarian development and peace nexus. It's something we continue to work on and advance in different areas. We launched our uh, new strategy on fragility, violence and conflict this year, um, which really demonstrates uh, a commitment to stepping up on this agenda in a number of ways. And in particular, working uh, in several so-called hotspots with a focus on the Sahel, on Lake Chad, on the Horn of Africa, and the Great Lakes. Support to these regions are a critical uh, piece of the work that we do in the Regional Integration Unit, but across uh, the, the country work as well. Um, it was recognized in, in the studies that I referred to that fragility and conflict drivers are often cross-border and regional, regional in nature. Um, they're often, the, the conflicts often occur in borderland areas where they're distanced from the political uh, center and the economic centers. And that feeds this, this issue of uh, the feeling of exclusion uh, and distrust towards the state, which we're seeing all across the continent. Um, cultural, linguistic, family, economic ties across borders also create linkages that may not necessarily align with administrative structures. And so uh, conflicts um, and uh, also public goods, uh, they generate these spillover effects that can often uh, create issues that develop into domestic crises that can quite quickly become regional ones. So we all know the Boko Haram insurrection, it began in Borno, but over the course of four years has spilled over into Chad, Niger, Cameroon, and that region. Um, we know that the crisis in Northern Mali has, uh, uh, it started in 2013, but it's really spilled over into a protracted, protracted crisis. Uh, and we see that in other uh, corners of the continent as well. So drawing out some lessons from all of these developments and particularly with uh, perspectives of operationalization, I'd just like to mention four specific things. So I, I wanna start first with a, a note of optimism uh, we know that the drivers are regional in, in, uh, in many cases, but we know that the sources of resilience can also be regional as well. And so one of the things we're trying to do is observe the way of life of these populations in the very fragile regions. Um, it could be the pastoralists uh, who are moving across the Sahel and coming up with mechanisms uh, for supporting and trying, uh, we do a lot of work on trying to help manage conflicts between the pastoralists and the farmers. It could be these women in the Great Lakes who are moving across borders every day, um, sometimes in an informal way, but trying to make sure that small scale trade continues. And so one of the things we're trying to do is look at, understand and build on the existing resilience factors to help prevent the exacerbation of conflicts and to support the local actors who may have solutions 
uh, closer at hand or have, have ideas where, where we can make a bigger difference uh, to some of these issues. Second, um, we're very focused on adopting a dynamically responsive geographic approach uh, in these very fluid environments. Um, you know, it's very hard to know how these conflicts are gonna move and develop from one day to the next. And we need to be quite modest about our capacity to be able to predict these things. Um, and so we want to uh, invest in the work of identifying the red flags in areas where preventive actions are needed. We work extremely closely uh, with the UN and with other uh, partners, bilateral partners in the Sahel, in the Horn of Africa to keep an eye on where these conflicts are moving. Uh, one example of the type of thing we're doing now is uh, while we have a very substantial engagement in the Sahel, we're also starting to work in those border areas of the Gulf of Guinea countries to try to get at those northern areas to prevent some of the issues that led to conflict in say the, the, the three frontiers area of the Sahel. So put in place uh, some supports that can help address uh, potential drivers of conflict. We're also working to create and uh, work with others on regional knowledge and monitoring platforms that help policymakers to have accurate and recent data on the regional trends. Um, it's a collective effort. We're working with many um, uh, to tap into both national authorities, local actors, and of course, working with uh, uh, people around the table as partners. Uh, so thinking about how we can be fluid in understanding where the conflicts are moving, use the best sources of information and get ahead of of some of the uh, drivers of conflict uh, is, is a key thing for our work. Third um, is we're working uh, on what we call an integrated territorial approach. And what we mean by this is how can we provide the types of support and services to local communities that can perhaps help prevent the radicalization that leads to conflict. Um, we're aiming uh, to cover the most pressing needs of the population, those of youth, of women. Um, uh, it, we've, we've already talked a little bit about education. We've talked about jobs. Um, we're, the approach that we're working with others on involves uh, the implementation of this humanitarian development peace nexus. And uh, although we get a lot of criticism for not working together, I think actually in many of the spaces, certainly in the Sahel, uh, the Horn of Africa and others, we're trying not only to cooperate, but to try to integrate the strategic and operational approaches in the fragile environments. And so thinking how we can be responsive at the community level to help provide the support that can um, help communities feel to be more part of it and, 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 and get ahead of some of the grievances or at least address the immediate needs and grievances. COVID has really put a uh, a, a big emphasis on this in terms of health response, education response, et cetera. Fourth and finally, um, I'd just like to note that uh, we all know that this is a long-term endeavor. Um, and so while we are addressing many of the immediate needs uh, uh, of COVID, of the pandemic, uh, the response to climate change as well, um, all of these factors are gonna continue to exacerbate conflict if we don't also think about the jobs agenda, which uh, um, was brought up by some of the other speakers. So we are thinking both, how do we address the needs in the short term, the immediate aspects of saving lives, of helping to respond to the, the, the social needs, but then also this question of how do we continue to build and bring in the private sector in a way that will connect these elements of resilience and crisis prevention and create an environment in which we do build job opportunities and jobs at a volume that's high enough to give these youth something that will be able to give them hope in the future. So we're focused on doing more and better to support the development of private sector actors who are also working in the trenches, trying to keep their businesses going, uh, running things in a very challenging environment. So, so this whole role of how do we also make sure the private sector and economic activity continues to advance, whether through regional value chains, through supporting small scale entrepreneurs, uh, through education and skills, 
um, it's a very critical part of our agenda as well. So let me stop there. Um, uh, many, many issues to address. Uh, happy to respond to any questions on the agenda and the issues that we've talked about. And uh, I thank you for, for your time. Thank you very much, distinguished director. Happy to see that the World Bank is, is heavily engaged and working at, at the driver's side of, of the equation. And as you have said in your concluding uh, 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 remark that somehow you try to, to do that and, and to keep improving the resilience without lo losing the, the sight of, of uh, creating jobs and, and having a, a thorough look at the long term objectives. So, so that shows, and this is what we truly expect from, from the World Bank. And uh, uh, as I said, uh, again, apparently we're, we're all speaking the same languages of how to, to cover prevention first and foremost is one of the most elusive and, 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 and difficult and challenging term to address in such a, in such a panel. You see, even in medicine, when, when you'd speak to a patient about prevention, you would give him a very uh, a detailed manual and very long manual of things to do and not to do and, and so on in politics and in peace and security. It's, it, it's even more challenging, more elusive, more difficult to cover, but, but the inputs we have been receiving from different aspects and different prisms is, 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 is really impressive. I have had two, two like uh, questions and I would appeal to, to panelists, I'll, I'll give you all the, the floor once again, uh, if you'd wish to comment on what other has said and, 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 and if, if you'd uh, uh, as well, we have one question here that has to do with uh, uh, is there any plans to involve environmental development to help communities unite and connect for, uh, for, for the biggest goal and risks with the existing climate change facing all of us? This is the climate change aspect, and I believe USG uh, Rosemary De Carlo has, 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 has raised that concern as well and said that the UN cared a lot about cli climate change uh, uh, as a as, uh, as, uh, a disruptor sometimes in, in different uh, situations and so on. Uh, another question, is it too sad that we cannot interact with all uh, participants? Uh, it, it's, we're trying to avail an opportunity given the time constraints, of course. So, so now back again to, to USG, uh, Rosemary De Carlo, you, you have the floor if you'd wish just to give a concluding remark or, or what are your takeaways? And, and, and if you'd wish to comment on what Azar has I stated you have the floor once again. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, just Ambassador, just to, to say that on the issue of environmental development, yes, of course, we do have agencies. It's not my department, but agencies like the UN uh, Development uh, Program and the UN Environment Program working on environmental development to bring communities together around this very important issue. The, the one point that I would just like to make, and I think I heard this in every single speaker, was the issue of inclusion. Uh, and I really do think that's a huge focus for us going forward. Uh, we, we see how much people are marginalized and what this leads to. Uh, and uh, it's something uh, that we probably, if, if we can make uh, some headway in this area and being helping to create more inclusive societies, I think we will be far more successful than we have been. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Yes, that's very, very important uh, comment. Uh, 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 reducing the gap of inequality is extremely relevant. We thank you both for, for raising that. Uh, uh, the distinguished uh, uh, high representative, uh, uh, Mr. Ramadan Alamra, you have the floor, sir, if you'd wish as well to give a concluding remark, you have the floor. Yeah, well, thank you very much. Very few, very few things. Uh, first and foremost, to thank the organizers of uh, this forum once again for bringing us all together. I always uh, say that uh, peace and security is uh, in fact uh, an intellectual uh, challenge while we know that it is also a, 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 an operational long-term uh, endeavor. Uh, but uh, I think to cope with the intellectual part of it is already a way to enlighten the pace towards uh, solutions and uh, to uh, endow practitioners with uh, not only wisdom, but also uh, knowledge and lessons learned 
from other uh, people's experiences. So I believe that uh, a forum like uh, this one is uh, a very good place for such uh, mutually enriching uh, give and take processes uh, to, take, to take place. And I believe that what uh, has happened this afternoon here is a clear testimony that, to the fact that we need uh, more of this. Uh, equally, we certainly uh, need uh, more of uh, this kind of integrated uh, common work on, on the ground. Of course, uh, uh, in the area of uh, uh, peace, we have had experience of uh, hybrid uh, force in, in Darfur. And uh, now that it comes to, to an end, I think one has to, to salute the uh, initiators of, of these ideas, which has shown that uh, under certain circumstances, the only way for the international community to find its way to a particular place is to uh, be very creative in terms of mandate, in terms of resources, in terms of uh, uh, methods of work. And we do have in uh, uh, Somalia another type of, uh, uh, of hybrid mission. Uh, the the, the AMISOM is certainly uh, uh, something that we can be proud of. It is fighting terrorism. It, uh, it costs us and it costs troop contributing uh, countries uh, a lot of uh, casualties, but it shows that the international community can get its act together and implement uh, concerted uh, action uh, in different parts of the world. And as far as we are concerned, in different parts of, of Africa. Now, extending the uh, silencing the guns uh, uh, term and uh, uh, conceiving of a joint action over the next uh, 10 years is uh, quite, quite natural. I believe that uh, we have been very optimistic by considering that the period of time, the span between 2013 and 2020 could be uh, sufficient in terms of uh, uh, changing the dynamics throughout the continent. I believe some of that has been achieved, but as the conflicts evolve in their very nature. And as we need as the international community to adjust, to adapt our resources, our tools, our methods of work to a changing environment, I believe that it was quite natural to have this extension. Now, I believe that the Peace and Security Council working closely with the UN Security Council and our other international partners will have to work to establish benchmarks and to be as ambitious as possible in defining what needs to be achieved in a particular period so that we could build on the achievements and make uh, breakthroughs so that we can make a difference between now and the end of, uh, of the, the decade. So I believe that this is an effort to be pursued, to be pursued intensively with confidence that there is no other way to defeat terrorism, to defeat the causes for, for conflict, including, as I said, the kind of hybrid conflicts that we will have now to cope with in different regions uh, of Africa. And uh, to end also with a very positive uh, note, I think there is enough wisdom and vision uh, within our people that we can also rely on national reconciliation whenever it is possible to save human lives and to make sure that uh, the people of Africa can work out their differences and build on the values that they share so that they can offer a better future to incoming generations. Once again, thank you and uh, God bless the Aswan forum and uh, the leaders and the managers of this excellent initiative. Thanks.
Thank you very much. Uh, such a wonderful takeaway and, 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 and such a wonderful exercise of applying our minds today intellectually so that practitioners like uh, our good selves in, uh, closer to the field can, can operate better. Uh, Dr. Eddie Maluka and Dr. Ernest and, and, uh, and, and Ms. Deborah, I'll give you one, one minute each because they are uh, killing me and the organizers to conclude. <laughs> so Dr. Maluka, you have the floor. No, thank you very, uh, very much, Mr. Chairman. I think uh, uh, we have said enough and uh, I just wanted to just to emphasize, I think it's a point that Ambassador Lamambra raised that we have enough wisdom he was referring to communities, but I wanted to say that we have enough wisdom among us. We as APRM, we saw that in action when we went to Sudan, we were asked by the government of Sudan to assist them, move the country forward. And uh, we deployed a team there to do a, gap on, a governance gap analysis for the country. And we didn't hire a single consultant. We went to AU organs, we call upon them and they all avail their talents and each of these uh, uh, Again, they have their own solutions, their own tools. We combine all these tools into one instrument, one tool that we deployed. And now we were working with, the, with Sudan on uh, examining the report, our recommendations, the findings, and, and, and we will be working with the, with the authorities there. And, and of course, also with these different stakeholders. So we have enough wisdom among us and fragmentation is not the way, collaboration indeed, and a holistic approach. And this is really what uh, we, we have experimented with in Sudan and it worked very well. And we also extend this hand of collab for collaboration to our colleagues in the UN to say that uh, we, we are open to working with them in our own member states in, 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 and drawing on their tools, their solution, their instruments, their processes to enrich ours so that we can of course move our continent forward together and of course achieve our our objective of silence in the gun on the continent. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And thank you thank very you much all. to you and my regards to you and to everybody in Addis and of course our colleagues in Cairo who are conveners. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Maluka. Dr. Ernest, you have a final say as well, quickly to be followed by, by Dr. Deborah. You have the floor, Dr. Ernest. Well, I would like to express my sincere thanks for giving us the opportunity from the National Peace Council to be part of this. I trust that, uh, like uh, Dr. Mayoka said, uh, we have a lot to share in common in Africa and uh, pulling our resources together will strengthen uh, our unity and our force to work as a continent. Thank you very much for the opportunity. God bless you. Thank you very much. Dr. Deborah, you have the final words. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I would like to just make the point that I think uh, um, the inclusion agenda and the governance agenda are inextricably linked. And the points that Eddie Moloko raised are really very important. Um, and thinking about how we can do more to bring those together will be critically important at the community level, at the national level, at the regional level. And so um, much work to be done. Uh, appreciate the very excellent points made by all the colleagues. And uh, Thank you to the Aswan Forum for continuing to advance on this very important agenda. I'm only sorry that we're not in Aswan. I have some beautiful photos from the last event. And so uh, I miss a little bit the scenery, but, uh, um, but thank you so much for uh, continuing the fine work that the Aswan Forum is doing. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Deborah and Mike. Mark, my world will be waiting for you in Aswan next year or later this year, inshallah, once we all defeat the COVID. I'm extremely grateful for everyone, for, for, for USG Rosemary De Carlo, for, for His Excellency Ramadan Amamra, and my, my dear friend Eddie Maluka and, and Dr. Ernest. For all of you, I, I do thank the followers uh, who has followed us live on, 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 via the internet. and. Uh, and looking forward to seeing you in similar encounters in different places. Have a great evening uh, for, for those who are about to have the evening and have a great day for uh, Ambassador De Carlo and, and Dr. Deborah in, in the US. Thank you very much. 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 This session is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you very much.